I'm John Leonard Smith, everybody in the rugby world calls me Snacks. I am the head coach of the University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities. Uh, tonight, I stepped in to present during Raza's session, so if you're expecting the presentation on women in rugby, I'm really sorry you're getting defense. But I'll do my best to make that interesting. Um, I've created this presentation assuming nothing. I don't know where you come from. I don't know if you're high school, college, club, men's, women, boys, girls, flag, touch, whatever. Um, the principles remain the same whether it's all those games or if it's sevens or if it's 15s. Specifically, this will relate to 15s because that's the season we just finished that I'm most comfortable talking about. But I'm also pretty decent at coaching sevens, so I can answer those questions too if those come up. Um, any questions before we begin? What's up? How's your day going? Great. Three o'clock wake up to get my kid to the airport by five. Kid missed her flight. We dealt with that. I had practice at 6 a.m. Finished that at 8. I've been doing my presentation since then. Got in the car about, what, four and a half hours ago, guys? And we're here. Walked in, put our shit down, and away we go. I may say some four letter words. I'm really sorry if that offends people. I'm a military guy. So, whew, there is a lot of people in here. Okay? Just get it. Uh, first thing I want to know, what do you want to accomplish in this session? What are some things you're thinking about defensively, strategically, tactically, macro, micro, big picture, small picture, whatever you want to name it? Anybody got any things that they'd like to accomplish or hear about? All of it. All of it. First day for this. In years since around, especially in Wisconsin area, that they put something out on this course coaches. Uh, we've been, you know, YouTubing and searching the internet, whatever we can do to find it. So thanks for coming. Glad to be here. So, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. I'll tell you what, what's your name, sir? Matt. Matt, you get to be the judge by sucker now. <laughs> Matt made a great point, right? We just come out of 18 months of the pandemic, unprecedented time of education and learning, professional development for coaches. Uh, I stuck to defense the entire time. I absorbed as much defense as I can. I don't think I'm a great defensive coach yet, but there's enough out there now to be dangerous to put together really great framework and structure for your programs to be awesome defensive teams. Um, I like to, I'm a, a kind of coach where I don't like to talk at you, I like to discuss with you. So, this is a picture of us playing defense against Nebraska. It's a picture I'm just using as an example, but for you, all, what does a great defense look like, or feel like, or sound like? This is Communication. Loud. Flat. As in what? Flat. Flat line, so off the rough maybe? Okay, what else? Connecting. Not crowding. Not crowding. Give me a specific example. Uh, you're not crowding on the rock. Not crowding the rock, right? Not bunched up at the fringes area. We call that maybe getting bodies on bodies. Yes, specifically on this closer half, does we look like we have bodies on bodies? Yeah, we're, we're pretty decent there, I would agree. Or I would, I would argue. Um, what else about this picture do you notice that may indicate that there's good defensive play about to happen? Line speed. How do you know that? They're all moving forward. They're all moving forward. Specifically, let me see if my laser point works. Yeah. Our outside center and our wing. You can see they're already in motion. The ball's just left the hand. Okay. What else does a good defense look and feel like, sir? We got a lot of numbers. We got one guy. They're in a good place. They're lined up. He's in trouble. That's a great word. Remember that trouble, pressure, right? So just a little backstory. Um, what's it? He's at the butt. There's actually a winger outside over here. This is one of their flankers, actually in a first receiver position. These are all their forwards over here, knowing, don't knowing what the hell's about to happen. These guys just secured this last rock. This is Sean Doyle, our nine. We'll talk about what we give the nines role and, and maybe what you can do later. We give him free reign. Josh and Jack put lots of pressure here. They take this guy down. Sean comes in, earns a penalty. 
quick tap, transition, try, two phases later. And it's, it's pretty simple. We put pressure on it, and there we go. Uh, any other thoughts, comments, questions about what good defense feels like, looks like, sounds like? Sound tackling. Sound tackling. What does that, what does that feel like? What does that, how does that feel to you? You make that, which you make them. You don't pull your own field shot. Don't pull the one-on-one. The one bullet, one kill. Right, sniper, bang, bang, on the ground. How many people have got a one bullet, one kill under their belt? Great open field tackle, chop tackle around the legs, get them to the ground, you're over in that jacket position, you're ready to go. How many? I'm gonna raise my hand twice because I just love that as a problem. Don't be scared, raise your hands, it's fun. Defensive spot, yes sir. <laughs> Shit, yeah, <laughs> Okay. Um, Something we talk about a lot these days in, in the sports world is culture, okay? Now, we heard folks like Legacy, Culture Code, Talent Code, Cody Royal, Owen Eastwood, we've seen all these things coming out, and if you don't know who those people are, come and talk to me about them. They're great resources. They have lots of podcasts and great stuff out there. Culture is a framework. It's how we do things. It's our behaviors. It's our standards, okay? We want to talk about how do we create a, wait, where's my laser? How do we create a culture of defense? Okay? How do we how do we as a team, as coaches, how do we create what we're gonna do on defense? What's the first thing we should do? Move forward. Move forward. Move forward. To create the line speed, to create everything we're gonna create. What is a team? Maybe as a coaching staff first, and then as a team together, what should we do? Communicate it. Prioritize it, build trust, we talk about it. We, we, we sit down and we say, this is what we're going to do. Okay, We're going to have this type of defense. We're going to do these types of activities to build that framework, to build the, the alignment, the assignments, and the things we'll go over. If you don't talk about it, no one has a fucking clue what you're going to do. And then you see ones up, twos up, you see missed tackles, you see missed assignments, you see people not quite knowing what to do when there's a two on one or whether they should play it slow or fire up on them, right? You've got to put some framework in it by having the discussion, by having a whiteboard, taking a marker out at practice. I firmly believe that bringing your, your whiteboard out or even, you know, notebooks for each other, like having kids or your player to bring that, and you talk about what it's going to be, you put things in place that stick in their brain, stick in your brain, and then you move ahead. Yeah? Terminology structure is important. If I say the word bagamashka, what's that mean to you guys? Not a damn thing? Bagamashka? Has anybody, if you ever watch a University of Minnesota rugby video, specifically the last one we saw, you're gonna hear me screaming, Vagamashka! Vagamashka! It can't be a tell me what that means. Uh, I believe it's the Ojibwe word for waves. Ojibwe word for the waves the waves arrive. And for us that's light speed. That's for us get oh we'll go back to slide. For us, Vagamashka means we're gonna come up and we're gonna get in their face. Every single time. What do waves look like on a shore? They're relentless. They come in. They go out. They slam in again. They go out. Who's been to Hawaii? Anybody? Anybody ever been to Sandy's Beach on the sort of not north though, the eastern side of the island? Anybody? It's a short break and it hammers tourists. Like tourists just get eaten up in this washing machine type way and slam them on the ground. When I think of defense, that's what I think of. I think of constant pressure, relentless pressure. Keep moving forward. Keep dropping bodies. Keep looking for opportunities. Our word is Bagamashka. The Chiefs, Waikato Chiefs, is Tai Nui. Right? It could be any word you have. It could be Thai, it could be whatever you want it to be, but if you have something for that, and everybody knows what it means, you're on the same page and you're ready to go. Okay? So, uh, anything else? Anybody have any examples of terminology they use or analogies? 
Yes, sir. Bulldog. Bulldog, what's that mean? Wire. Wire, come up. Oh, yeah. There's, uh, yeah, four, yeah, four numbers on one side. Yeah. Anybody else heard Bulldog called something else? Anybody ever heard the term shooter? Shooter in rugby, right? Uh, point man, point person, point woman, whatever, whatever you're playing. Yeah, you could be anything. As long as you know what that means and your team's setting it up, that's good to go. Now once you have your terminology and you start creating this culture of defense, like this is what we're going to do, I recommend setting simple goals. Very simple goals. What are some goals you could possibly set defensively? Hard five. Shoot up hard five. Hard five. Hard five steps? Yeah. Okay. Mark the, mark the player. Okay, so we want to get everybody in good position. We want to launch off the line, is what I hear you say. Yep. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Pressure on the first receiver. Why? Inside and out. Good force air, right? Good force air, that's good stuff. In terms of goals, in terms of goals, the simpler the better, right? I want to put a thought in your head and somebody talked, I was talking through this after a webinar defense and they said, you know, Snacks, you can make every tackle and still lose the game. And you could miss 75% of your tackles still win the game. And I was like, are you out of your mind? But it's true, what if you play a perfect game, but they just beat you to space? They put the ball in space, the guys around the corner, they score. You played great defense the entire time, except for the time they just missed that little bit of space. So I would recommend not setting goals around tackle completion, Missed or made tackles, positive or negative tackles. What does that sort of do if you start saying, okay, we want positive tackles, negative tackles, passive tackles, aggressive tackles, we want to miss, make, whatever. Thank you too much. Oh crap, I missed two tackles. Percentage is down, coach is going to be pissed. For us at Minnesota, we have a very simple goal. I'm going to call up my collision coach and put him on the spot and see if he remembers, Bob, what's our defensive goal? Numbers on our feet. We want more bodies on our feet than the other team. Okay. If you if we go back, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Right. 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 We go back to that picture. Ryan's my savior. She's our marketing social media manager. Helps me out when I'm nervous. So thank you, Ryan. Yes. There we go. Okay. Pop. Oh, there. Where are we now? Yeah. How many numbers do we see on our side? <coughs> So we have 13 players on our feet right there. 13 players on the feet, how many does Nebraska have? Nine. Ten. Maybe 11, we'll give them that one. How many more opportunities do you think we're going to get if we go one or two players up on a team? A lot, actually. A lot. You get a lot. If you're playing on your feet, and you're playing square on, which is pretty simple goals to play, you get a lot of opportunities. You can steal that goal. I highly recommend it. It has done wonders for us in Minnesota, both in 7th and 15th. Um, as coaches, once you've set your terminology, once you've set some goals, how would you make it stick? 
Repetition is the mother of skill. Repetition is the mother of skill. Practice is the process of something you may never master. Right? Practice, 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 practice it some more. Every single time you're in, in an activity, you should have an attack and a defense component, unless it's a technique drill where it's specifically about one thing or the other. Always, always reinforce your defensive principles no matter what they are. Always reinforce your attack principles. Right? This is where I forget what next slide is. So I'm going to do this. Ah. Okay. Now we'll talk about some framework structures. Okay, we'll talk about 12 plus 3 versus 13 plus 2 versus 14 plus 1. And sort of what those shapes might look like for you as, as, as an individual team. Okay? When we discuss these, the first number includes the numbers of players in the front line, the second number of the players in the backfield. Simple as that. Yeah? Line outs, you hear six plus one, six players in the line out, one player out. Very similar uh, terminology. And who goes where? Who goes where is an interesting question. Where would you want your forwards, if you have a perfect defensive line, whether it's 12 or 13, what part of the field would you want your forwards in? Center, which field, which forwards in the center? That one? Tight five, tight five. Very tight five. Yeah. I just cramped up. So you want your tight five middle of the field? Okay. What about outside that? Who are you looking to get outside that? Loose forwards, maybe? Pokers? Pokers are all the more loose forward these days. Right? And then outside that, who do you want? Wing centers, right? Centers and wing, uh, centers and back rowers, pretty interchangeable these days in terms of defensive, jackal, poachers, ball fetchers, uh, counter ruckers, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, agree, disagree? Yeah. So type five in the middle, minus the hooker, Eddie. Poker goes one side, eight man goes the other side if you're playing a one three three one or one three two two or two four two, whatever you're playing. Get your best runners in your wider channels. They're also great ball fetchers, so they get an isolated opportunity out wide, you put them there. <coughs> Centers on one side, wings, wings. Who do you put in the backfield? <coughs> Ten. Why? Decision making and kicking, pull that wide. Safety valve, probably same. Decision making, kicking. Yeah. Good. You want most two players are typically distributors now on a two distributor system if you play that complex of a system. Or it's just two of your best players who get you the most attacking opportunities and organize your your attack as quickly as possible. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just for knowledge sake or, or like a uh, picture of this, right? We have a 13 2, 13 players up on the front line, two players back. Okay? This is pretty standard defense that's being played throughout the world now, internationally or professionally. Why do we play 13 up? More chances. More chances because of? Numbers. More numbers. Yeah, more numbers. Agree? Disagree? Any other comments on a 13 2? Okay. 12 plus 3. What are the advantages and disadvantages of that? Anybody play this? Why wouldn't you play it? Shake your head. Can I put you out? Yeah, Can I ask you? Ways of people in the back of it. Okay. What's one skill we have not gotten quite proficient at in the United States yet? Kicking. Kicking. Okay. Kicking is a skill, much like passing, much like catching, much like evasion, and it must be practiced. I highly recommend seeking out your Australian rules football club nearest to you. I need someone to come in. We did that last year, and our kicking has been exponentially better. They know how to kick. They know kids we can't even think of. Got three. CJ also turned out to be a junior at our school. 
And he now plays rugby, and he's one of our fly halves, one of our fullbacks. Great under the high ball as well. Aussie rules teach great area skills. Don't say you didn't come away with anything. What? Yes, sir. 13, the 13th rule in 12-3. You're swinging eight men. So you've got a fullback, and you've got a wing as the ball comes here, and that fullback slides, this wing comes out. You know what? So you've always on 13 2? On the 13 2, or is that more the 12 3? 12 3 is typically typically the swinging gate. You pick one wing back, or your, and your 10 and your 15, and then sort of who knows the ball comes out, wings comes down yeah. on the line. Okay. You can do that, or you can simplify it and say we're only going to go 10, 15, and this wing, everybody else is not. Some wingers are actually really good tacklers, but you don't want to waste them back there waiting for a kick that may never come. Okay? This here is really good if you have a team that likes to rip it, rip it down the field, and just put balls in your hat and try to take over a turnover that way. Or teams that box kick and all that other boring shit. Okay? Sorry, I'll go we'll die on a hill. I hate box kicking and I hate balls. But I coach them. I coach them more these days because the guys want to do it. But 12-3 is a great, a great defensive structure to play if you're going to play a team who's kicking. Okay, 13-2, I would highly recommend that to everybody because it puts more numbers in the front line, more numbers on feet, more bodies on bodies, it gets you more opportunities. So in that case, if your stronger tacklers are your wings and your distributors, which tend to be strong half, the, the fullback or the, the number 10, um, putting them in the back? So, that is a personal choice for you as a team. Okay. Okay. We put our 10 and our fullback at the back because they're the two players we rely on most for decision making. Okay. Our nine, we actually have several nines um, that we're working with. Uh, but what we do, so 13 2 is kind of a misnomer here, right? It's a little bit of a decoy. The nine is included for us in that line. All right. He patrols behind. He, he patrols behind, fills gaps where he needs to fill, and we've given him creative license because it's the way our defense is set up. That if he sees an opportunity, go for it. Right? Who remembers what I said? The outcome of that picture was turnover. Who did I say did it? Scrum half. Sean Doyle. Right. We have Bennett Pufu as well from Marquette. He's also been empowered to do those sorts of things as well. We want our nines to play similar to Falau Noia does in sevens, just be a menace, get over the top of the ball, harass the other nine, do whatever they can to make things to make things hard. And shoot the first receiver from time to time, come up, bulldog them, or whatever you want to call them. On that five yards? No, we have he's, he's like in the line. Like, there. Okay. like if this is the defensive line, he's either here in it, or he's right here going, guys, give me guys, give me guys, give me guys, get over here, go over there. He's direct traffic as well. So the messages come from Nick and our, our fly half in the back to Sean or Bennett at, at our nine position, and we fill gaps as quickly as possible. We're not, we're a college team, so we're getting good at it. We're not an international team or a professional team, but it works. It works for us. Um, 12, three, 14, one. You can see it, it says try line right there. So our back's against the wall. Typically teams inside their 22 will shift the other player into the line to create another body and put somebody deep behind in case there's any sort of cheap kick or whatever. And the closer that they get to the goal line, they may have a policy to bring this man or player to me into the line itself. Go 15 up, okay? If you're, think about field position. If your back's against the wall in a 14-1 or 15 up, what sort of mindset, what sort of like atmosphere do you want to have in your defense? Tenacious? Why tenacious? I could agree with that. I could agree with that. What don't you really want inside the 22 though? Well, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> what don't you want in there? Field? What's the game about? It's about fucking points. 
You don't want to give up a silly penalty inside the 22 because that's three. Tick the box, bang. Everybody can make a kick inside the 22. Hopefully. <laughs> Everybody can kick in the 22. So you got to find a balance of being tenacious and not bending but not breaking, right? And also having the awareness not to commit that stupid penalty right in front of the post or a makeable kick. And again, that goes back to talking about it. Right? We all have young athletes, young men and women, girls and boys, that they're, uh, they switch, right? Fight, flight, or freeze. Everybody talk about those responses. When, when the poop's hitting the fan and people are dropping bodies and tackles are happening and people are posting and guarding and doing whatever, they may forget. But if you talk about it beforehand, you maybe do some activities to work on those types of things, they won't forget. And they'll, they'll come through for you in that moment, and you beat uh, Iowa State, 36-35, right? Okay. Now, we've got our framework, right? We can pick 13-2. Shit, you can play a 15 up for all I care if you want to. But as long as you practice it, you play it, and everybody knows what's going on, you're good. Yay, nay? Yay, nay? Okay, all right. Now, what type of defense are you playing? What, what are some of the defenses out there we know about? Blitz. Drift. Drift or slide, right? Blitz or rush. Is there a combo in between? Some teams are playing a hybrid. Yeah, yeah, they are. And I'll talk a little bit about it right now. Actually, I'll talk about it at the end. Let's put together what a blitz and a drift look like, and then I'll kind of explain how a team could put that into a hybrid model, but it takes a lot of practice, but it's, aware, it's good to be aware of that, because you may see things on the professional international level and go, holy crap, that dude just missed his assignment. Why is he letting that guy to the outside? And it's all, they want him to go outside, right? Okay, and then uh, the type of defense we are playing, how does that affect our launch? What does launch mean? Get it off the line, right? Everybody up off the line. Good. First, uh, actually, we'll have both of them up at one time. We'll talk about the drift first, right? Typically, drift defense. Where are you? Where are you aligning? Sternum on. Sternum on inside shoulder, right? As I'm launching up the line, what does my attack look like on the on, on their attack? Inside out, inside out, right? Inside out, pushing them towards the touch line. Using the, using the sideline as the 16th player. I forgot that I put that in there. Okay. A drip defense is typically looking to stop tries. Of the two, it's not the more aggressive defense. Right? You're looking to just stop tries, be in a good position. You know, hopefully they make a mistake, you get a scrum or a knock on or whatever, right? It's a low risk, low reward defense. Now, it doesn't mean you're not going to get rewarded, but because you're not aggressively pursuing the tackle contest area most times, or you're using the touch line, you're not going to get as many turnovers, right? You may not also, you also may not get the consequences of playing a blitz or a rush, which is too many penalties. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, a drift, weakness in the drift is because we're going up and out, we're susceptible to those inside running lanes, that back inside ball from a 10, right? We call it a truck. Boom, truck ball goes right back inside. You go, oh crap, arm tackle, they're through. Okay? That's, that's the weakness in a drift, okay? What, do you, what defensive framework might a drift work best in? Well, three. Well, three, you don't have that extra player? So you're using the sideline as an extra man, extra player. Okay, now, I'm gonna get a little excited about this because I love it. We've been working really hard on this, but the rush defense. Oh my God, I love the rush defense. It's exciting. It gives me screaming Baga Mashka a million times. Okay, actually this morning, we were playing touch, or a touch game, one of our guys was hurt, and I said, Connor, Ben, what do you guys notice about the defense? And I stood there like this, waiting for like an epiphany, and Connor, one of our freshmen goes, Coach, you're just not screaming Baga Mashka as much as you used to. <laughs> and I was like, well, you're right, we're not launching. 
We're not launching off the line. That's our cue word, right? Bhagavashka means physical cue is get up, get on your feet, get moving forward. Okay? Drift, deeper, or ooh, excuse me, rush. What alignment are we in? Outside in. Right? Why would we want an outside in alignment? See the person and the ball? What else do ball carriers do naturally? They drift outside. They think the space is outside, so they drift. Now if you're already outside, they're inside. Let's say, let's say here's right here. They drift into this space right here. You've taken three less steps. How many times over per game? You conserve more energy. They run right into your trap. You put them on the ground. You go for the counter run before you go for the jackal, and you're ready to go. Everybody see how that is? See why I like that? I love that. I love it, right? Okay? We apply pressure with line speed. You're getting up, getting on your feet, bodies on, numbers on feet for us, or bodies on bodies, and you're moving up on them, you're just <coughs> relentlessly hammering them with the short break. Hammering them with the wave. Um, it's high risk, high reward. Sort of mentioned that when we're talking about the drift. One of the results that we had from switching from a drift to a blitz defense was the amount of offside penalties that got called on us. Unbelievable how many offside calls. And I might be biased, but we're just that fast. Okay, we're really fast, and we're trying to get up off the line. But you know what? I'll take offside penalty all day long if we're moving to get the ball. If we're I'll explain why Bagamashka is not a flat line in a second, but if we're getting up, we've got numbers on feet, and we're looking for opportunities, that means we're playing really good defense. You agree, guys? Yeah? Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's my support group. Had to bring it with me because otherwise I'd be crying right now. There you go, Rodney. Um, what a blitz defense is susceptible to is what they call late running lines. Okay, if my outside is here, I'm cutting inside, you get a decoy runner or, or like a blocker and a, a roll out the back, that's susceptible to a blitz defense. So with a blitz, with a blitz defense or a rush defense, you gotta really hammer in who's got who, what's the assignment, right? So first, we talk about the framework, we talk about the alignment, and we talk about, start talking about now about how important those assignments are. Okay. Who are we marking up? And what happens at the tackle contest? For definition's sake, the tackle contest is any time we get a tackler and a ball carrier, or a tackle, ball carrier, and assist, or a tackle, ball carrier, rucker, however you want to determine that. Any number of that, right? Because any one of those individual situations has a decision, and we work that. We know what we think we want to do in those positions. We have cues for that as well. Um, so, who takes who off of a rock? For simplicity's sake, I highly recommend one, two, three, A, B, C, D. Post, guard, pillar, holy shit, which P am I? I don't know. Am I the G? Who do I got? Do I got the 10? No, I got one. My job in the one is I'm harassing the nine every single time and I got anything in that inside gap. Yeah. Two, I've got the first receiver coming off there. Three, I got the next second receiver in the point or the arrow formation. And four is our killer, right? He either takes the outside man, takes away the optical plane, or he takes the escape route and smashes the 10 out the back. Or makes his life really hard. Great picture of him diving at 10 because boards don't usually catch him, but that's where we put him, right? We put the killer right there. Why do we have one, the one, harass the nine? It's fucking fun. It's fun. Little, those, those people, they get mad as hell. They're decision makers. They're mad as hell. They've been tackled one or two, one, two, too many times. They make mistakes. They're not in the right position. They're the people that, that, that are counting on to get the ball to the right place fast. Yeah. Um, anybody else have any sort of recommendations about marking up footwork? Who, who's a, who's a inside foot up type coach? So 
of the, the ruck is here. No, ruck is here. Inside foot up, outside foot. What happens if we go outside foot up? Screened off this way, and our head tends to go where the ball is. We automatically, without thinking about it, start ball watching. Yeah? Neutral or inside foot slightly up, keeps our shoulders square, looks at the attacking threats that are in front of us, and we can look out the corner of our, or corner of our eye, or we turn our head slightly to see them. Okay? Now, well, Holly's made a top eight defense right now. Actually, it's time to play. Um, who calls balls out? Everyone. Everyone. What if everyone forgets? Who do you want to call? Well, since we say one or two. What? A little bit more angle, maybe, to see it. Yeah. Right? Might have some bodies on the ground. That one is in here. And he's just worried about the nine. And so he's focusing all of his attention here. His voice is going to project into the ground where nobody else can hear. Two's up. He's a little bit away. He can say, falls out, and we're launching with his shoulder square to the front. Yeah. Is your one a, a shooter at this point when he comes off the run, or is your one stable? The best answer I can give you is it depends on the TV point. It depends on what he sees in front of him. Okay. Right? So we tell one, their job is to create from this inside shoulder to the edge of the rock anything that comes in there. Whether the nine taxis or the nine taxis and there's a drag back inside. They come up into that space, win some space back, get across the game line, even if it's just a foot, to sort of take away that opportunity as best as possible. And either they're holding on for a passive tackle, or they get a really good shot on them and they're running their feet through the tackle and putting them behind the game line, if it goes there. But how many teams are really attacking this gap here in these days? No. No? The attack gets quite bad. Yeah. Kicking goes or no cutbacks. Cutbacks. Nine goes. Ten or nine goes. Ten goes. Oh, uh, is it the right? That's the reason. You know, one one to take a step up and rather than stay home and protect that area because that nine could be almost a decoy for what's coming back in that gap. So this is the ruck here, right? Yep. Tell me when I'm too far. Now. Okay. So how many steps is that? Three. Yeah, three yeah. So you you can say as a policy, guys. We're in the what? We're in the A gap, we're pillar, post guard, whatever. We're gonna come up one step and we're gonna stay here. And we're gonna be a deterrent so they don't run that, that gap back there. That's a happy medium, would you agree? Yeah. Because they either they'll freeze and they'll stay in that gap or they'll come up and smash the nine and you're gonna be really happy about that. Yeah, I don't know. So, the nine's a big one exactly the same, but it's just when he travels too far, I'm scared of the guy chasing him. And as he chases the third, let's you go, you got a four that's high attack. Three ball, ball. beginning of ball. Yeah. G ball. If you get the G ball, we'll get rid of him, I would say. Anybody else got any sort of scenarios that we're trying to mark it up? What we found as coaches, where do we find the most confusion? Have we had any? Anybody got any experiences with that? Number four guys where you have to take one together. The, the killer? Yeah. This, this player? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This takes practice. Coming up on this player, and either they get it out the back ball through this channel here, or, or uh, a turn and pop to the nine or the ten, right? What's a, what's a telltale sign that the ten is going to get a pop pass from the nine around the back from that player? The ball handler. Division three rugby. If you've got any good big people in that pond, they're going to make that pass on that. Well, you might be coaching high school someday or college. Oh, I do. Yeah. yeah. If you see the 10 outside of their pocket pushing wide, they're probably going to give you some sort of misdirection inside that pond. So you should all come up and four, four should be pulling a, man, a player into this position here to try to take that gap. This right here is called the corner, the corner option. Some teams will put a 12 there and make it look like they're going to this spot. 
advanced move, but it started to happen more, right, by misdirection. If you all think that pod's going, all the big headpiece are going in there, and all of a sudden, that little fast back or wing. Wings, especially if you see a wing start coming in this area, look for them to get the ball. It's becoming really popular right now, 200 percent. What I'm going to run Okay. <laughs> So one thing that we, we talk about is terminology, right? So I don't know if I've said it yet, but what we talk about is we put our sternum on the appropriate shoulder. Sternum on the outside or sternum on the inside. That's like my center mass, right? Because I can technically put my eyes on you like this, right? Or like this. But if I put my sternum on you, I'm square to the target and I keep them there. If they don't know what the sternum is, you tell them. <laughs> yeah. okay. Now, we talk about double tackles and single tackles, right? We talked about a, a great one one on one tackle earlier, right? Chop tackle or choke tackle. What's a chop tackle? Chop tackle is low, lasso around the legs, get in the ground, get an opportunity. Okay? Choke tackle is up, attacking the ball, tying the ball up, trying to create a uh, a pseudo ball situation, turn it to your side and get that turnover as well. Okay? So we talk about two things. We have double taps and one bullet, one skills. Anybody notice anything about the terminology? Military. Burger. Burger. Military is only, aren't the only people who kill you. Murder. You're putting them on the ground. You're burying them. You are aggressive. You are you're going to finish that job, right? Now, it's figuratively, we're not really killing people, but it helps us understand if we're going double tap, double tap, double tap, we know we're going two, two players in. Okay? If we go one bullet, one kill, specifically seven started that, then we brought <coughs> double taps into 15s. We know you, it's your player, one on one, we're coming maybe in an assist or a hustle situation, right? Um, where do you think double taps would be executed most? Goal line? Near the rock. Near the rock. Near the rock. In the in the big body areas, right? Okay. Who said one go high, one go low? Okay. So that's another part of this process of talking about your your, your plan is if you're gonna go, hey, we're gonna double tackles within the first four players of the rock. Inside man's got to go low, outside man tech takes the offload lane away and then attacks the ball, or opposite, right? I go low, you attack the ball. Okay? One thing though, you always got to take the offload lane first and then go to the tackle contest. If you're not getting that offload lane, teams are getting real good at that now. It's just nice, they call it the tips option. Bang, go bang, okay? Uh, if you are, Quick test. If you're going for a choke tackle, what's your target area with the shoulder? The ball. The ball. You're going for the ball. Right? The ball's a great indicator of where you're still low and in play and not in that high tackle matrix. Okay? We use six pound Amazon Basics med balls in practice because it's a big target, it's soft like a hit shield, and it costs $20. So we, if we're getting under that or on that, we know our shoulder work is going to be detailed and in the right place, and we're going to get an opportunity in the choke tackle. Okay? And also just really fun to play with. Sometimes you, you swap in a 20-pounder, and they don't know it, and they love that. right? Um, but we use those. right? We use those these Amazon basic six-pound med ball. I swear to God, it's one of the best tools we have. We do grip and rip. We do wrestling. We do jackals, sprawls, you can do anything on them, right? It's like a pseudo hit shield, and it's like half the cost, easily, okay? Um, choke ta uh, excuse me, chop tackle, what's your target area? Thighs, where are the thighs? 
maybe the logo, logo on the shorts, right? Maybe from the shorts to the knee. If you get any higher up there, maybe start getting in that dump tackle area. So practice that. I would highly recommend practicing getting that target area down, especially now with the way the referees are going. Everything's a high tackle. Everything's a red card or a yellow card. That foot comes up too high. Right? Minnesota's killing us at the moment, but you know, you've got to be mindful of this stuff. Any referees in here? Damn it. No, I'm just kidding. Performance triangle. We need refs, players, coaches. Coaches, staff, physios, managers, all the other stuff. Good. Any other anecdotes, stories, experiences with double or single tackles when they work or effective or anything? Yes, sir. Yeah. We, we're playing at Heart of America Championships in Lawrence, Kansas. We have a six foot six lock and uh, another lock who's six, he's the skyscraper. And they both came around and one lock hit, got hit in the same eyebrow twice in the weekend. And they put it on TikTok, it looked like this. He's walking around. And he's like this massive man. I'm like, oh, that's the biggest golf ball I've ever seen. So yeah, Casey, you're right, right? Getting, that, getting who's going low, who's going high is super important, right? And if you're working in enough in activities and you, you, you get those, oh crap, he went high, I better go low. And they can work to find their adjustment points in their, in their, uh, in their tackle setup, right? In their tackle profile. Yeah. In that situation, are you, are you also trying to coach the tackle assist or, you know, I've got ball, take the ground, I'll release, and then that second tackler automatically bolt to that tackle right away. When you do the go tap, it depends. It depends. Now, the breakdown is one of the most, referees, raise your hands. Is the breakdown one of the most complicated things to referee? To do it can be. It depends. Okay? Right? So, With the, it also depends on the goal of your defense. Let's, let's go back a step, right? So we didn't talk about the rush defense. Blitz defense is, or sorry, drift defense is about stopping trying to score. scored. Rush defense is about getting the ball back, getting an opportunity. So if you're about scoring, stopping tries from being scored, maybe your double tap is get him to the ground, get the like by your line time to set up, and get another launch off. If you're in a rush defense or a blitz defense, you're going in there, we're attacking the ball, we're tying them up, we're driving them backwards, we get them on the ground, and then we bring an assist in. And that's all, it all goes back to that, set the expectations, set your defensive culture, set what you're going to do, and, and talk about it, right? A lot of times now we see the Sean Edwards defense, right? France brings the guy back with a passive tackle, waited right here for an assist, bang, right over the ball. All of us can do that too. It's just a matter of working that skill in a choreographed situation to a slow movement situation to a full go, you know, full go but small sided situation into the bigger picture game, right? How you coach that is, is up to you, but if you can get any of that done as long as you talk about it. Yeah. I can't emphasize communication enough. We communication is what? The single most quoted improvement at practice. How many times go, what can we do better? Communicate. Yeah, well, we can too as coaches. We can say, we have a plan, everyone. And this is what it is. And what do you think of it? And if somebody says, I think maybe we can do this better, or hey coach, did you see this one video? I'd like to try that. That's your opportunity to say, shit, yeah, let's try it. We got practice, this is a laboratory. Let's get creative, let's try that out. Or, hey, take five minutes, get two guys, let's get the ball carrier on the ground and give us a different picture. Are we, are we long place, are we height, are we doggy door, right? And get a jackler over them and look for where their hands go. Right? And just start there. Start building your process, building your, your stock. Adjustment, third end, right? Alignment, assignment, adjustment. 
What happens after the tackle contest? What if we win the tackle contest? What if we get a poach? What are we going to do? Communicate. Two away. What's that mean? Two passes. Yeah. Two channels. Two passes. Two people. What else? Any other policies we have when we have a turnover? Two passes, but the best I've seen and heard. And why is two passes after a turnover effective? Gets the ball to a wide channel, and that's effective because that attack was sitting in an arrow formation with a 10 out the back and a fullback looking for an inside line, and they're not ready to play defense. In the soft shoulder. Use your footwork to get evasion. Bang, bang, bang. Right? So if we win the tackle contest, you got to know what we're going to do. Essentially. Okay? Either we hold on for dear life, earn the penalty, game management, we go for a kick, or we get the penalty, we pull it back, two passes around the corner, we try to go for the score. Yeah? That's also part of your framework is, and your culture is, are you looking for your defense to turn into attacking opportunities? Or are you happy just not giving up tries? It all depends on you, your team, the type of athletes you have, your strengths, your weaknesses, your comfort level in coaching certain techniques or tactics, right? And, and getting that into the atmosphere of your teams. Yeah? Yeah, hey, agree, disagree. Does everybody feel comfortable coaching the tackle these days? Yeah? How about the, the tackle contest? It is a gray area. Who wants a good drill? Okay. We have one called pinning. Okay. We have the short bags that we use as a simulated tackle ball carrier. I'm sorry, we tip it up, we have tackle, the tackler go from one knee, drive the bag into the ground, run the feet, and then they have three choices. Okay. There's a player with a bag and a ball. No, no, I'm sorry. Player with the bag, player with the ball, and now the player with the bag can get over them and pin them to the bag. And what does that indicate? What does that indicate? <clears throat> Got to roll out. No opportunity. Okay? Bag holder gives them space. The ball is there. Counter up. Okay? Tackle goes in. Ball goes down. Bag holder's late. What is that? Jackal. Okay, super simple. You, you, we do it quite a bit. I stole it from a sevens team that I've worked with periodically, and I think Nick, as a player, that specific role we've done quite a bit. Would you agree? How how do you think that activity has affected your gameplay and your teammates? Um, Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, the other way is you can progress that too, right? So you get a tackler in, they get a pin, they're rolling away, second man comes in, and then all of a sudden you have an attack component there as well, right? The, the assist comes in or whatever. Okay? You can either have, and then also you can get a tackler comes up, counter rucks, assist goes over, second bag holder comes over and blasts them, you know, get them ready into a combat position. You can play with that little that little window in the game. You can manipulate that with tackle bags. You can manipulate that with hit shields. You know, ball, no ball, right? And, and, and talk about it. The other thing is like the fun part is the roll away, right? Rugby's a game of play, running, jumping, catching, throwing, um, spinning, stepping, cutting, on the ground, getting up, on the ground, rolling. Running really fast, losing my feet. Oh crap, I do a somersault and I back up on my feet. Right? How many times has somebody seen that in a game and go, wow, that's really cool? Do it in practice. Do it in practice. How many of you were in the Midwest? How many have wrestlers in their program? Who's got the sprawl? Who knows about the sprawl? Double leg takedown, single leg takedown. Play on that, those types of skills that they know from another sport, play on their sense of play, and watch what they'll create. Some of the some of the, the players that through this one pinning drill 
are getting so athletic and getting out and getting into the line that it gets us more opportunities. Time? Okay. Two things. If we don't win the contest, what do we do? The answer's on the board. Fold or hold? Who knows what a fold is? Okay. Fold. A fold is the replacement of numbers in the line. Okay, so if you go one tackler in, you generally go one player to the opposite side to replace that spot where they had just left. If you go tackler and assistant, you go two. Okay? In the old adjustment, we used to put players here first and then here, yeah? Those of you who've been in the game, yeah? Now, what they're saying to do, and it's actually pretty effective, is the first man, this man, who's usually here, pulls out, takes that third player, and then you feel accordingly whether you need one or two, and as they're coming around, it's called setting a trap. Because remember, we talked we talk about the nine looking at having an opportunity there. Well, all of a sudden, they see space, but they don't realize the hustle is getting their butts around and it's above them. We rip them right at the game line. Okay. Again, folding is the replacement of numbers from where a tackler or an assist came. It could be two, it could be three. Right? It could be one. What is a hold? Lots of blur. Hold is actually if the numbers go, say they do not bring numbers this side, go hold. And you stay. You need to know when to hold, when to fold. Know when to hold them, know when to fold them. Yes, sir. So, you have your back or Yep. You usually set that back to the narrow side. Is that all part of your job? Good so question. Right, right the flow is through the offensive right here. Right? So, if the ball goes out to the offensive right, are the people in the break that we want them to set back up on the left? Even if you do have people. Yes, and it, it, it's hard to see because it's a really light color, but right here we have, after the tackle, the tackler and the assist join the line and track is normal, depending on what side that is. Yeah. And, and you can do that however you want, as long as you talk about it and put it in the fire. Okay, what micro skills should we focus on? Okay, so notice we've gone from the 10,000 foot level down to the 5,000 foot level. We're, you know, 4,3500 feet, now we're right on it. We're right over the breakdown, we're right over the, the, the rock. Okay? My personal opinion is that tracking is 75% of the job. Getting to the ball carrier and getting in an effective body position is 75%. If you can't get to them, you ain't gonna tackle them. If you can't get your foot in the hoop, you can't tackle them. If you don't know what foot in the hoop is, I'll recommend a resource. Can learn that yourself. It's a really good one. Okay. Tracking 75%. What's a great way to teach tracking? If you knew nothing about tackling, tackle practice, tracking practice, breaking the skill down to its basic components, what do we have as humans, as Americans, as rugby players, as athletes? What do we have? You're it. Tag games. Evasion games. The Rookie Rugby Manual is the best manual for tracks. Has anybody ever played Rats and Rabbits? Sergeant Stripes? Two feet on the line, call one side, and the player moves, and then you gotta tag them if they run, or they, they tag you if you run. Ever played that game? Great tracking one. Right? Uh, we play 10 pass, complete 10 passes in a row with your team, and you score a point. Defense has gotta track those ball carriers, and they're moving in all different directions, so you've gotta go multi directional. Uh, touch is a great one. Offside touch, or it looks more like ultimate rugby. We don't stop. We let them run. Let them run, track them, keep them moving. If they get tagged, they stop and pass the ball. Right? Those are great games to teach tracking, to, to work on tracking. Like, again, be able to inter intervene in those and stop them at certain points and say, hey, we're over pursuing it. We're doing, if you notice and your arms are coming out a lot, you're not tracking very well. Let's use the feet to get in a good position. Okay. The other micro skill, right after we track them, we're going to smash them. We are going to smash them. First things first, shoulder, foot, same foot, same shoulder, near hip, clamp, drop them to the ground. Everything in the tackle. Everything can be broken down. 
uh, break down decision, when to poach, when to counter, when to connect. Right? We also use animal names, jackal, gorilla, python. We don't, we don't have one for, for getting in the line, but we just say, get out, go away, right? Uh, and then your ground game. One of the single most, the, the most utilized skill in a rugby field is getting your ass up off the ground. How many different ways can you do it? How fast can you do it? How can you do it in a manner that you get in a good body position? Right? Uh, jack knives, hit, uh, hit pops, uh, half moons, burpees, you know? And I'm not saying do 100 burpees. I'm saying, hey, three burpees, give them to me. Bang, bang, bang. And real quick, they're getting their muscle memory down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Yeah? You guys love that. You want to show them what it is? Well, I want to see it. Bob? Bob Ricard? Half moon. Half moon. Half moon. It's also one of the most highly debated exercises we do. Oh, fuck. Take it away, Bob. Okay, so start over the ball after your coach. Down. Oh. Down. Oh. Tyson, don't do it. Ground game. Now, I said I wanted, wanted to leave you with some stuff. All these things up here on this board are free resources. And great people to absorb their information and their content. Okay? First things first, the top two, I am the biggest believer in the USA football shoulder tackling system. You register, you take the course, they give you drills, they tell you how to break down the skills, they give you terminology, they break it down nice and easy in a basic, simple simple way to understand it. If you want to go into the advanced shoulder tackling system or what they call the five fights, you can pay for that and do that too. I also think that's a worthwhile investment. It goes on sale periodically, so keep your eye out to that. How you do that? If you follow this young man right here, Mr. Andy Ryland, at ADR Coach Development on Instagram, or at ADR Coach Dev on Twitter. Andy's a Penn State, All-American linebacker, All-American flanker, Eagle, loves rugby to this day, but he's the senior training and education instructor on the tackle at USA Football. If you tweet him, he will answer. And he wealth of knowledge. Meathead, biggest meathead there is for Penn State, but he'll answer. I've learned so much off that guy, it's not even funny. Send him drills, coach, that looks great. Geez, coach, can I take that? Yep, sweet Andy, there you go. Okay. The other one, right now World Rugby's just come out with Richie Gray. Richie Gray is the breakdown tackle connoisseur, works with the NFL, works with professional rugby teams. Uh, he's working with La Rochelle right now over in France. But he was the guy that the World Rugby went to and said, we need to clean up the breakdown. How do we do that? How do we make it a fair contest for the defender as well as the attack? And his answer was first to get the referees to referee it properly. And then he said, then we'll go and do this. Okay? He created an entire system that we've been looking at and been utilizing. Uh, tracking, what the fuck things? Tracking. Yeah. Right? Five. Does a test. Say it again, what, Bob? Tracking, preparation for contact, connection, acceleration for connection. The preparation section alone is worth its weight in gold to get your athletes back into contact ready positioning or contact ready shape to get into contact or to tackle, excuse me. Okay? Who knows about the World Rugby Passport? Anybody know about it? Everyone go to World Rugby, sign up as a coach, if you're a coach, for your World Rugby passport, and there is a plethora of free courses on coaching, refereeing, basic strength and conditioning, player welfare, player experience, and the Tackle Ready program. Highly recommended. Highly, highly, highly. Okay? Coaches to absorb in no particular order. Sean Edwards, Rugby League man from Wigan, won a bunch of contest, went to WASP, won a bunch of premiership titles, then he went to Wales, 
himself 13 2 there with Warren Gatlin. Now he's at France, and France is whooping everybody's ass. I dare you to look at their defense and listen to a couple of podcasts with Sean Edwards and tell me you don't want to run through a fucking wall after. This guy's awesome. Lori Fisher, Rumby's coach. Everything about the breakdown, both on the entry for attack and the decision making or the speed of arrival for the defender, he just gives it away on his Instagram. Post videos almost daily. Mostly of the tackle contest, lots of catching and passing, lots of like different parts of the field work. Lori is, I couldn't say enough about him. He started to do podcasts recently. Great rugby mind, great coach, has an awesome outlook on how to do things and how to, how to get better as a human being. Uh, Sue Lancaster, pretty, pretty divisive figure in England, but he's at Leinster now and he's killing it over there. His defensive stuff is great. We got a game from him called Defend the Castle through one of his webinars, and it's it's just this multi-directional game, and it gets your fitness up, it gets defensive connectedness going. He basically absorbs information from books, puts out stuff on his LinkedIn. LinkedIn's the best way to get involved with him. Uh, he will post webinars, he'll post his analysis of certain books, his analysis of games. He's very accessible, and he may even uh, get back to you if you send him a message on LinkedIn. Okay. Accounts to follow, Lori Fisher, Omar, I will not butcher that man's last name, but he's the defensive collision coach at the Bristol Bears. He's worked with France, he's worked with South Africa, he's worked with the USA. He's got some interesting stuff. Fernando um, just left the Los Pumas 7s, right? He, everything contact, everything strength and conditioning, contact preparation stuff, he's got great stuff on his Instagram as well. And then Andy Riley. Uh, Twitter accounts, Rusty Earnshaw, the Magic Academy, anybody, anybody heard of that? No one's heard of the Magic Academy? I highly recommend following the Magic Academy. It is literally a podcast with the best coaches of the best sports, or of all sports, at the top level of their game. And he's even inter he's even interviewed coaches in the USA room. Vera Douglas was on there over the summer. He will talk to anybody and everybody and just half of the nuggets out of one episode is incredible. One day, I was riding my bike during the pandemic in 2020, and I was like, geez, I've been absorbing a lot of content, a lot of information, and I don't know how to put this into play. I'm overwhelmed. That day, he did a podcast with Dr. Anna Stoddard, who her whole PhD system is in how coaches learn, and how coaches are effective. And that led me down to the Coaches Discourse podcast, which is all academia, nerdy, geeky type stuff. And that, that is just another rabbit hole to go down if you want to. We'll talk about it over here. Uh, Phil Llewellyn, defensive coach, he did a great webinar. Sam Larner, Sam L stands up. He also does whiteboard rugby on Instagram. Basically explains concepts in the games on a whiteboard. And he's only got like 100 followers. <laughs> Professional rugby coach. Uh, Durant Davies, great analysis. Puts out a bunch of stuff on YouTube. Just went full-time rugby coach. And then uh, Andy Riley, again. Couldn't say enough about Andy. Big meathead, love the guy. Wants to come to Minnesota and check us out. I don't know if he's scared to have a coach of that level, but it's good. Um, uh, oh, we're done. Any questions? Thank you for letting me run over a little bit. I was nervous as hell. Did I suck? Absolutely not. Thank you. I won't hold you from inside.